the frequent depiction of Habsburg troops as utterly exhausted and increasing apathetic, which I use a lot in the book, I explain by saying, the mental and physical condition of the soldiers is critical to understanding this key battle. The exhaustion experienced in combat under winter conditions is incomprehensible to those who have not had the misfortune of suffering under such circumstances. Reading the daily logs of the Habsburg units participating in the Carpathian Winter War, one would be hard pressed to find an entry that did not include the phrase ganz or schuft, or utterly exhausted. The men's physical and mental exhaustion was exacerbated by hunger. Food supplies often did not reach the front, and those that did were frozen. Many of the food carriers froze to death trying to take the food to the troops. In those conditions, the troops began to hallucinate about food, driving them nearly to insanity. In the winter of 1915, not only did Habsburg Supreme Command decide to deploy massive armies into a region totally unfit for a major combat operation, it did so with no provision for the most basic of necessities, food, clothing, shelter, proper equipment, even ammunition. Combat exhaustion, and this was true on the Russian side too, I'm just giving the austro hearing. Combat exhaustion became even more widespread when a shortage of reinforcements forced soldiers to remain in the front lines. There would be no relaxation. There would be no rehabilitation. So they would have to stay there throughout the entire campaign. Such was the fate of hundreds of thousands of Austro-Hungarian soldiers in this uh, battle. Few conflicts, including uh, World War II and World War I, have recorded such debilitating uh, conditions. Debilitating, excuse me. As a recent study on the psychological effects of war explains, quote, in war, there's perhaps no general condition that is more likely to create a large crop of nervous and mental disorders than a state of prolonged and great fatigue. This is multiplied by winter weather and mountain warfare. The cumulative effects of exhaustion, hunger, and combat on the soldiers on this front were multifold. One is the uh, physiological effect of battle and stress on the human body. Sleep deprivation and re reduced food intake compounded the effect on all these soldiers, which the natural elements, including snow, fog, rain, dark of night, made even worse. These factors in combination created, quote, a state of prolonged and great fatigue, end of quote. Combat-induced stress causes the nervous system to alter its inner survival instinct. Bodily functions were uh, or are similarly affected, often as the fighting ended and the soldiers became weary. During combat, the soldiers' emotions rose and fell. And by the way, this is, this is uh, I've been invited to command and staff school because if you read a military history book that does not mention supply, luck, terrain, and weather, you might as well throw it away. Uh, you want to read a book that someone who's actually been in the military who can des describe these things because when I describe the condition of these people, I mean, it's absolutely unbelievable. You can read words that you lost two million people. And today's students and today's history people, what is two and a quarter million people? Well, it's Tampa, Florida, and, and almost all of Orlando. That's the only way I can get the students to understand how enormous the losses were here. But I could go on about the you know, lack of sleep and, and uh, the effect on the body. But to give you a background now, well, you know, I think I'll jump to why it, it, it didn't succeed. And this was true on the Russian side as well. Um, I had first. <clears throat> on neither side, the Russian or Austro-Hungarian, were the plans either well thought out or well prepared. On both sides, there were not enough troops on either side to fulfill the objective, to fill the offensive objectives. Both the Russian a commander at first, but particularly combat at Herzendorf, failed to have mass. Mass is a primary military factor that if you're going to attack, you have the numbers to break through at that point. That never occurred. On both sides, the offensive was, uh, was launched in haste, which led to tens of thousands of deaths, etc. 
the Austro-Hungarians were fighting time. They had to save the fortress. Thus, instead of any type of maneuver warfare, they launched frontal assaults. And the problem was there was no artillery. They couldn't get the artillery into the mountains. If they did get into the mountains, they couldn't get into position. If they got into position, they couldn't get it out. They had to retreat. So the commanders uh, would take fewer artillery batteries and hope the shells would get up there, which many times didn't. So again, the Austro-Hungarian troops are attacking uphill against the Russians, and they have no artillery support. So you can imagine what kind of bloodbath that would be. Um, obviously, the Austro-Hungarian army was short on troops. When they started the war, they had 1.4 million troops, lost 400,000 at the two battles in Lindbergh in 1914, had a million casualties by the end of 1914. So did Germany, so did France, so did Russia. So when they start this campaign, instead of having mass, they keep sending more and more units. So it ends up that four Russian armies will become tied down in the mountains, and the Austro-Hungarian army will put uh, three quarters of its troops there. What does this mean? When the Gorlitsa Tarnoff offensive drives the northern Russian flank, there are four Russian armies trapped in the Carpathian Mountains, and they have to get out. And many of the troops don't. And this, and this is why the Eastern Front, you read about the bloody battles in the Western Front, the Eastern Front, battle to battle, had as many if not more casualties. Again, uh, the wounded and the sick, at some points, the sick outnumbered uh, the wounded or dead. Uh, you couldn't fight a battle with troops in this situation. And the main enemies for Austria-Hungary were terrain and weather, and for the Russians, terrain and weather. So that not only were you fighting an enemy, you were fighting to stay alive with the weather, etc. Habsburg troops came within 50 kilometers of saving that fortress Schmitzel, but at a cost I told you about. What's going on in the fortress? Well, the fortress had way more troops than it should have, and it had 21,000 horses when it should have had four. The fortress survived till March 22nd because they killed the horses. Now, that meant the soldiers had to live on horse meat. They, to get wood to keep houses warm and the barracks warm, they had to go out and patrol and cut wood and bring it back to the fortress. They, they already are cutting their rations November, December 1914. Russian accounts of when the surrender occurs on March 22nd talks about these physically impaired soldiers who can barely walk, but all their officers are nice and fat and plump and healthy. There was corruption throughout the fortress. The officers' wives were made nurses with no training. The doctors spent as much time keeping the nurses away from the patients. They would give them tea with, with stagnant water. These people would be dead the next day. The troops would not come back until they were so physically exhausted they would appear at the hospital and over half of them were dead within half an hour. The doctors were overworked. This March 19th breakout attempt in a 122-day siege. They lost thousands of soldiers collapsed in the streets trying to get to the perimeter of a fortress. And when they attacked outward, not to win a great victory, to protect the honor of the Austro-Hungarian army and the emperor. The Russians knew they were coming. And as soon as they cleared the minefields, they thought they were going to be able to attack the Russian positions. They would not know they were there. And murderous machine gun and artillery fire opened up and tore down the ranks. The 23rd Hanbei Infantry Division lost 78% of its troops in, seven hour, in the seven-hour battle. And what had happened throughout the entire war, if you read about the First World War, the Second World War, any war, what you should really read about, too, is the intelligence operations, or lack thereof. Because it was a game to break the Russian code, it was a game to break the German, Austro-Hungarian. The Austro-Hungarians actually had this man that weighed about 350 pounds, that walked around with two canes in the streets of Vienna with the Maria Theresa Award, which is the Medal of Honor. Every time the Russians changed their code, they sent him to the front, and he broke it within 24 hours. Well, but the Austro-Hungarians didn't realize the Russians had broken their code. They knew exactly where they were going to try to break out. And it was an absolute bloodbath. And um, I'm doing a book on Fortress Schmitz. will come out next year, which is sort of a follow-up 